Hello, everyone, and welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and Human Humane Architecture. I'm DeSoto Brown. I'm this program's co-host. And joining us live from Germany, where he is currently stationed at, is our host, Martin Despang. And uh, does Martin want to appear on screen? There he is. Hello, Martin. Hello, DeSoto. Hello, Hawaii. So what are we doing this you. week? We, as we promised in the last show, which was about our way of therapeutically dealing with the unfortunately soon to be raised, erased uh, Princess Kaiolani Hotel, we promised to look at other hotels who might be keepers, right? Correct. And if we can get the first picture up here, please. At the very top left, you see when we were out there in this next project that we're going to talk about today, looking at the Princess Hotel, and it's using a methodology which you see at the very top right. We did a show with Timothy Schuler, our journalist colleague, and he uses a very interesting way of researching, which is walking. So on Kalakaua Avenue, uh, rather than cruising down in your convertible, where you can see things but not things like we're going to talk about today so what you see here is something i saw when at some moment i was looking up and i started to be intrigued and, and you have told me since it's uh being conceived you have you you admitted you had never seen that the way we talk about it today exactly right? i've never looked carefully at this building to be able to really analyze it the way we are about to do Okay, let's jump in because I was so curious, so I tried to get up there. And next picture is me uh, pretty much scavenger hunting here and sort of reaching out in a scary way here, flying over that little <laughs> bell straight. You can see in the back our favorite Pete Wimbley's uh, Bank of Hawaii building. And at the very top right, we referred to last week's show where within that sort of international uh, rationalism of the Princess Hotel, what gives it a sexy touch are these curvy lanai mm -hmm. uh, geometries, right? Correct, right, uh, right. Which are pretty obvious, but what we're talking about today is less obvious, but nevertheless intriguing. And you can see that here, that they went through the effort of basically casting these uh, the, this front with uh, panels. They're very, very subtly concavedly curved and shaped. And try this today, good luck, because that's that's poured in place concrete. The foam work, it needs skill. Everything we talked in many shows, we don't have, unfortunately, these days anymore. So let's look closer, go to the next slide here, because where I'm standing is is on, on these little anais, and they're using, implementing another, uh, very typical for the zeitgeist of mid-century, the breeze block here. And next picture, it's it's done in, um, in 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 a very sort of simple way here. They're, these are not concavely curved manufactured, but they're just applied in this sort of linear way and then sort of polygonally having this sort of you know breaking point. So you know, not not didn't take much to do that, but a very effective um, appeal. Next picture. Um, what was your response to that? Well, I, I was saying that, that there's a very there's a tr strong difference between the day and the night view here. What we're talking about is the exterior um, emergency stairs. And as you pointed out, every building has got to have those. These really are a feature, however, of this facade of the Outrigger Hotel, particularly at night when they are lit and the rest of the building kind of falls away and doesn't look as clear as it did during, during daylight. So between daylight and nighttime, the Outrigger Hotel has these two different views or different appearances based on just this one vertical stripe that's in that part of the facade. Exactly, and derived, as you said, from a very utilitarian uh, sort of background and not blinged or bedazzled as they like to throw things you know, on buildings today that make right. little sense functionally, but just try to you know, catch your eye. So let's move to the next slide here to the next picture and then as we know in building codes you need to have another egress this is on the other end of that sort of double loaded corridor organized building here this is an internal staircase uh nevertheless probably few people ever 
see that one. But as you can see, there's some nice attention to detail. There's a sort of dark stained uh, concrete in, in black, and the guardrail is very simple but delicately done. It reminded us, because our show is pretty much a Plato year about, as we said, keep this one, don't tear this down or alter it in a way yeah. that it wouldn't do justice to its sort of initial um, sort of character. And and the same, you know, we said that a couple of shows ago at the very bottom, by, top left here to my employer, UH, Snyder Hall, with similar features of breeze blocks and these sort of welded uh, rebar guardrails. Don't tear Snyder down, right. UH, please, right? So yeah. next picture. Um, most people will experience it this way in this hallway here. It, it is a double loaded corridor, so it's a very generic American type. Uh, rooms on the left and on the right reminded us of top right, our show about the Kahala Hilton uh, with similar features. But nevertheless, again, they went through the effort to widen the corridor in front of the room so you get more space there. And they were sort of soft edging uh, it in in this case here. So there's there's some subtle uh, sexiness to e even to that sort of very unsexy you know, right. type of a, of a, of a low, double loaded corridor. Right. Next uh, picture page here, and then you go down, and we you know selected three probably sort of privileged views of what people see in the. Uh, in, in, in the hotel. This is on the sort of upper level, the podium level, not on the ground floor, but elevated one floor above that. And this is here, uh, you know, has a typical sort of ornated carpet, pretty literal of these days. This is obviously new. All the interior is not original anymore. And what do you think the canoe you told me might refer to? Well, certainly I think, and I think you agree, that this is a reference to the hotel's name, which is the Outrigger Hotel. And it's because it was built on the site of the original Outrigger Canoe Club. And this right here as an art piece in the middle of the lobby is an Outrigger Canoe. Therefore, they are literally referring to their name. Yeah, as everything is pretty literal. Now, jump to the next one. We found something that is at least a little bit referring to some sort of, which tourism likes to pre, uh, refer to more to sort of pre-contact and and what we're interested in, post-contact uh, context. And, and here they're using lava rock, they're using some wood, which is probably wants to look like coal, probably it isn't, and there's some ancient pictures here. And of course, it's the hula grill, because hula is you know, what you highly dwell upon and brand tourism, what lures people, because it has this exotic touch. We don't do hula here, we don't have hula skirts. It's freezing cold here, by the way. So. You know, that's why people from Germany and other parts of the world yeah. come. Why? And another reason is next picture here is, is the stunning climate and the view to Diamond Head. This is uh, pretty plain and simple. It's unfortunately exclusive. It's sort of a VIP lounge. I was yeah. sort of, you know, spying through the, through the, the window and the door here. But it, it's got a glass front that reminded you of how um, probably the, the hotel sort of has been looking in the past because it was about the, the view, right? It wasn't Correct. about the interior and about the decoration, but it was more really taking advantage of what Hawaii has to offer, a spectacular climate, spectacular view. Yeah. And next picture, um, we are now uh, looking at a little alleyway because as you pointed out yesterday, this uh, project is squeezed in between the two first hotels, the um, uh, Royal Hawaiian and um, the um, Surfrider, the Moana Surfrider, uh, Moana Surfrider, and it's squeezed in there so the lot is confined, and these constraints basically inspired the architect to have this sort of sooth, uh, uh, sooth um, balcony style where he basically tilt the window to give people a, a good view. It's all about the views these days. And so that, and then they were, they were sort of semi-curving uh, the, the lanai slab. So you get this sort of more attractive, um, you know, way of, of outdoor experiencing. Yeah. And, and this uh, has been featured, not so much a building, but uh, the sort of row of surfboards has been featured by the, um, by the monocle. Um, uh, publisher in their city guide about Honolulu, and also Will Bruder was intrigued by sort of the, um, the, 
the syntax and the the rhythm of of surfboards being lined up. So um, again, the uh, the hotel is uh, next picture. Um, is sort of has been dwelling upon that sort of being in between uh, modernism and um, and the exotic and and these are treasures from your uh, archive, De Soto. Yes. And tell us a little bit about how you see the hotel was sort of sold and branded to the customers. Well, in 1967, when the Abrigo Hotel opened, it was a time when Hawaii was being shown to be modern, swinging, up-to-date, not old-fashioned, not overly romantic, but someplace that was just as lively as any other place, any other big city. So they wanted you to think the Outrigger Hotel, as you can see, is where it's happening. And that is a totally 1960s slogan. And the illustrations here really also show you that there's nightlife, there are cocktails, there's entertainment, there are well-dressed people, there's the surf. It's got everything happening there. It's Hawaiian, but it's also up to date and happening. Absolutely. And next picture. And while we're pointing out some earlier hotels, even by modernists, by Edwin Bauer or by Pete Wimberly, they were trying to do tiki things and alluding more to the pre-contact. Here, it's, it's purely this is America, right? Yeah. But it has America with a very uh, exotic and we can yeah, add erotic touch, right? Mm -hmm. Look at mm -hmm. the woman at the very bottom right. Yes. Right? And, and what is she the, wearing? Look at the dresses. What is she wearing? Yeah. What are you going to tell us about you what she's wearing? Even, I think she's wearing itsy bitsy teeny weeny Honolulu strand bikini. <laughs> and that's the German version of that famous American song, right? Itsy bitsy it's teeny weeny yellow polka, polka dot bikini. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in the German version, and you're a fan of these kooky German songs, yes, I am. dreaming about this tropical, exotical place in Hawaii. <laughs> And they were saying Honolulu strand bikini, and strand bikini is obviously the bikini on the beach. So you also see that sort of the Aloha shirt isn't really the um, you know the high end. It's more like the what I call the early like Hilo Hati, more synthetic things, and the flowers even look fake. So it's it's sort of a you know a, a very Hawaiianized American tropical dream, um, and and sort of yes. living that dream for these few days of vacation that you can. Afford. That's Let's right. go to the next slide here, because it doesn't just stay on the outside, but on the inside. Here is a is a postcard comprised of a couple of pictures, and I cropped out the interior rooms. And let's jump to the next uh, picture, and you again recall what we were talking about in the last show already. Yeah, we've got two things interesting going on in this view. In the first place, we've got the screen, which is not literally any particular design, but it is very modern, so it's got these incised or cut out patterns in it. But also the major difference between then and now is that rooms at that time were made very colorful, very exotic, really punch you in the eye with bright colors and lots of patterns. And today we've shifted to where hotel rooms are now bland, they are blonde colored things and light colored things, and you have a plain white bedspread, not a patterned one. That, and not a patterned colored floor either. So we've shifted from riotous color to a very restrained palette for hotel rooms. Very less playful, very less exotic, erotic these yeah. days, right? Right. And right. our tropical tourist expert Suzanne has touched on that in her show and we'll refer to her later on. So let's jump on to the next uh, picture here. Uh, again, bottom one from your archive, uh, the top one, uh, all the pictures we're showing now are either from your archive or they are from a display, a glass, a display case that's on that upper podium in the hotel. And that top one is showing the pool. And notice the pool isn't, is primarily a, a rectangle, but then they went through the effort to give the, 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 the narrow end the same, uh, in this case, concurved uh, sexiness than you know the hotel has. So again, right. sort of right. corporate geometry here, we can say. Move on to the next slide. Um, again, uh, on the left, postcard from your archive. On the right, from that glass box. Trying to sell at the end, you know, given all the efforts that we recognize and appreciate, but it's still a pretty American, uh, you know, generic hotel box down below the corridor. 
but they try to brand it and, and sell it as as being exotic erotic. There is the correct, one of the and ones. also one of with an again. outrigger canoe in each picture. So in again exactly. playing off the name of the hotel, they're showing you an outrigger canoe in the facade in the foreground here to get across to you that it's exactly. Hawaiian. Exactly, and and the lady on the right is dress less, you know, the way yes. the wines used to be dressed. And then, you know, in the 60s where it was, you know, America free and, um, and, and basically emancipating itself, people were stripping off things and enjoying right. and being That's more, right. less That's dressed. Right. right, next picture. And uh, move on to the next slide here. Uh, the previous one basically said uh, something about um, uh, deluxe. Um, Sort of um, quality of, and this is this is a card from you that basically goes more specifically and says luxury with economy. And we wanted to point out while the outrigger chain was more for the middle class, unlike its immediate neighbors, the Royal Hawaiian and the uh, Moana Surfrider, right? Um, yes, uh, are more high end. But within the outrigger chain, uh, this one was the most high. End, yes, right. So relatively Correct. speaking, let's move. Yeah, relatively is, is the point, because as we talked about earlier, this was the high-end Outrigger Hotel, but Outrigger Hotels in general, as you said, were meant to be for middle-class people to uh, accommodate them to be able to come all this way to the Hawaiian Islands. Mm -hmm. So next one here, next slide. Um, let's go well, very briefly. We should probably dedicate an entire show to that, but... In two sentences, DeSoto, tell us a little bit how it all started with the outriggers. Okay. This is Roy and Estelle Kelly. They moved from California in the late 20s. Before 19, before the Pro War II, uh, Roy Kelly was an architect. He first worked with Charles Dickey, and then he was out on his own. He, de he designed a, a number of small concrete apartment houses in Waikiki before the war. And then in 1947, he developed his first hotel, and that's in the picture on the left which is the Islander Hotel, and that was the beginning of the whole, what is now called the Outrigger Hotel chain. Exactly, so very interesting example of what we call the architect as a developer. Right. Next picture here uh, showing us um, basically all the hotels, the bottom one is from you, it shows either all the one that he built or that he purchased and later yes. you know, made part of his empire. And um, at the top right uh, is from that glass case, and, and the top left is from you again, which you were keen to point out. Look at the heart around the building because right. they were thinking it's in the heart of everything, and right. it sort of is location wise, it's the prime location. Right. Let's exactly. move to the next slide where we basically see that um, postcard on the left again shows the, the main outrigger ones, and the right one we took a picture of one uh, on Cujillo Street that has now been purchased by Hilton, like the Garden Inn or something like that. So it's, it's, yeah. it's an empire in transition. Next yes. picture uh, that has also uh, ventured out, this is from their poster wall in the hotel uh, where they were showing to which other exotic places in the world they all ventured out, like the people with the outriggers way back. So the Voyagers, next picture. Correct. And we want to, with the next picture, start out uh, to phase out and, and make some suggestions how to go with this in the future. This is a shot we took like in the uh, later afternoon where the street is shaded and the hotel is sort of sticking out and, and embracing the, the sun and the views. Next picture. And but you don't see it that way. Usually you see, as in the next picture here, you see the, uh, the podium. Here we get the next picture, please. There we see the podium, the picture you took for us here, that two-story podium, and then the, the, the hotel uh, slab is basically pushed back. And I was curious, how would that have looked way back in the cool heydays of mid-century modernism? And you helped me out, next picture, and we're digging that out of your archive. And you can Correct. see very plain and simple, very glazed, us being keen on saying that architecture also has to perform somehow climatically, this probably worked out fine because this is facing pretty much east and then with the high buildings around it, it's probably always shaded. So it was right. biochromatically appropriate or at least not inappropriate to design it that way. And very lean and very clean and very 
sexy. These people need to undress, obviously, but they will when they go to the beach. They will, yes, right. Next picture. <laughs> Next picture. Uh, tell us about the other. You were already saying there's a lot more going on in the hotel than just sleeping. So what was Correct. That? And one of the things that they promoted in that, uh, in the earlier thing that we saw where they said where it's happening, they were also saying that there was a lot of entertainment going on in this hotel. So there was a showroom at which this particular group that you can see in the two diagonal pictures, the Society of Seven or SOS, performed there for many, many years. So the Outrigger wasn't just a place to sleep. It did have bars, it did have dining rooms, but it also provided live entertainment and was known for being a place that provided line of live entertainment. Mm -hmm. And let's move on to the next slide. Because while, again, the podium doesn't look original anymore, nor does the one of Pete, which we show on the left side, which had a plinth that was in compliance with the sexiness of the tower. And on the right side, it's not. It looks like the Cheesecake Factory next door. But there's a subtle little sign there that says Blue Note. If we go to the next uh, page here, next slide. Blue Note, if you don't know, is a classic jazz club originating in New York City. And they have selected locations all over the world where they have one. And we got one in Waikiki in that building. And on the left, I'm sure you were there, but we didn't know each other at that point because you being the Tiki expert on the island here, this was Don Tiki playing and Don Hibbert and Tropic Pier Rockwood and myself we went. And I went there with um, our tropical tourism expert, Suzanne, as well, for a smooth jazz show. So that's that's a good sort of continuation of uh, tradition of entertainment. Yes. Next one is another tradition, because uh, Suzanne remembers something else very vividly. And that's something very uh, erotically exotic. That is a pool that has a glass wall that's facing a bar. So that's as cool as you can get it way back, right? And yeah. we found that little a picture of the little mermaid at the very bottom left here. Everything was themed after that. And guess what? She's topless, right? So she's dressed yeah. as wines used to be. So there wasn't really, um, you know, um, people weren't prude as prude way back as sort of we got more moo mood now, both in what we wear and what buildings wear, right? Yes, that's right. Let's move on to the next slide here, um, which is. Um, Another institution within that probably most people know the building more for this one here. This is the legendary uh, restaurant Dukes that you can that our tropical tourism expert Suzanne remembers from some while ago, 20 years ago on the left, about it left her there, and then on the right her visiting. And again, it's an institution. Um, it's uh, it's a nice place that you pointed out is is rather egalitarian because yes. unlike the other restaurants where you have to get in from the street side here, you can just walk in from the beach. You gotta rinse your feet, but otherwise you're just out there and it's for everyone, right? That's so right. the hotel exactly has right. a very sort of inclusive approach versus being excluded. And that's something next picture we wanna further dwell upon here uh, because uh, Suzanne is originally Bavarian from Germany, that part where you think, you know, this is typical Germany with the beers and the journals and all that stuff. We were walking through downtown, uh, the equivalence to Kalakaua Avenue. This is downtown Munich, highest real estate prices. And here's some uh, sort of concerned citizens express their, their worries. This is your German learning lesson. You want to give that a try? So, uh, well, uh, the, 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 the top phrase is, uh, let's say, to hell with um, expensive luxury apartments. And below that, it says wellness for all, meaning they were anti-gentrification, correct? Exactly. And that's an issue, next picture, we are facing on the island here big times. And this is a really cute card you provided from your treasure box here about how they envisioned the outrigger way back, you know, in this sort of naive way. But you can see they wanted to make this, you know, thing that, you know, gave access for relaxation and, and enjoy paradise for a little while. It's, it's a little silly, it's a little naive, but I think it's well meant at its time. Uh, the building is, you know, has sliding doors, it's rather bioclimatic, so even though it's a big chunk of concrete, but within that, you know, it really tries to be a good building that sort of evolves Hawaii above and beyond what it was, you know, before contact. So uh, next picture, uh, building upon that, 
um, this is it under construction and you got to make some correction here and, and, and tell the people in the hotel to please uh, replace that sign up there, right? Correct. We this call is that Schnapps uh, 55 is, uh, is, is what, so we call, uh, you know, numbers that have multiple, uh, are comprised of multiple of the same numbers, Schnapps which means liquor number. So we got to replace that with the next liquor number, which is 66, which is familiar to me because it's my year of build. And that's when this was built, which you right. had said before, right? Right. So they, so were mistaking say, this hey, for the, they were mistaking this for the Reef yeah. Hotel, and it's actually the Outrigger Hotel under construction, not the Reef Hotel. Exactly. But why are we so keen on, on this stage of construction, the Soto? Well, because we're talking let's about... the next slide. Yeah, let's go to the next slide. What we'd like to talk about is the removal of exterior walls and the concept that... Um, Buildings can be made to be more adaptable as well as more appealing by keeping some of this, keeping a lot more easy breezy. This is one of Martin's class's projects, and it shows that Foster Tower, which is a, in a fantasy view, has been stripped of its exterior. It has a vegetated uh, seaside wall or Makai wall, and that's one of the ways that perhaps uh, things can be made more livable, but that's not the only one. If we Go to our next slide. We'll see that this is this is again one of the projects done by Martin's uh, upcoming architects who are still students. And this is Primitiva One, which is a cylindrical building which is open to the elements. It also is meant to be uh, where people gather, where people intermingle, where there's a lot of open space, where people are able to purchase their food uh, on the site of the hotel of the hotel of the building itself. They've got transportation, et cetera. Again, we are being visionary, if you will. And uh, next slide, I think we're going to go to, yeah, Martin, tell us what, what we want to look at here. You know, the recommendation of tropical tourism expert Suzanne is pretty much, when you look at the tradition here of the outrigger, it wants to be like a, an artificial mountain. It's almost mm -hmm. as big as Diamond Head as it looks here, right? And as we said, it was innovative. You know, at its time, uh, it was it was cutting edge. So uh, we should try to be that now even more because we're at the beginning of the 21st century. If we go to the next slide, which is our last slide, um, as we pointed out in many shows, and the last one um, about the conversion of the Waikiki Park Hotel into the sort of extension of the Kalani. Uh, we increasingly have a problem that the people who, who do all the work in the hotels for the guests can't afford to be on the island anymore, right? So yeah. we got this, you know, and we, we were saying, you know, to prevent a revolution and civil war, which has happened in situations like that in the past, we better come up with more integrative, more inclusive solutions um, as a version of what Suzanne and the industry call sustainable tourism basically mixes and you found an interesting island tradition that one could reactivate for that right correct we were talking last night about how during world war ii because of the lack of living arrangements for workers who had to be brought here to oahu to work at pearl harbor there needed to be people needed to share rooms and accommodations and so one man would have a cubicle or a bed to sleep in while he was off work and that might be during the day and then when he went to work at night, another man who was then off would come in and use that same space. And that was of necessity because of crowding. But what Martin and I have talked about is what about adapting more cohesive uses or co-uses of spaces to um, not only create more space for people, but also to bring people together. And what we've also discussed is the idea of having workers for hotels live on site rather than have to commute from a long distance away. And we're not there yet, and we don't know how that might shake out. But these are just, as Martin said, visionary views or ideas to look at for potential use in the future. Yeah, and it's sort of breaking up with the sort of territorialization and the terrorization of territorialization of space where you you know, you claim your room, which you only use for, I mean, you're in Hawaii, you're on, on the beach, you're shopping, Correct. and you only crash there for a couple of hours. So the other time it's wasted. So to so utilize right. that sort of wasted space is the attempt to look at the building more as a landscape 
that you can do sort of more freely inhabit like you do with parks. You pop right. up a tent, which is another great island tradition, it's what the locals do on the weekend. Well, it's fine for us. Of time, I think, but I, we are. But I think we got ourselves, yeah, we got ourselves into something. So next time, let's do another erotic, exotic uh, hospitality typology. And I think there is one just down the road, but let's not tell people more so they are excited and tune in. Okay, everybody, thank you for right. joining us for Human Humane Architecture. You'll see Martin again and me again in the future. Till then, aloha.